Good evening, friends. This is your host to welcome you through the creaking door into the inner sanctum. Come in. Come on in and join my wispy white friend. Oh, you're shivering. Cold? Well, don't let it throw you. Just remember that many are cold, but few are frozen. <laughs> oh, yes, your sheet is reserved for you. But please don't tear it. Remember the high ghost of living. Hmm. <laughs> now, if you've got some time to kill, let's kill it. <laughs> Tonight's Inner Sanctum Mystery, The Judas Clock, was written by Frederick Matho and stars Barry Kroger in the role of Sebastian with Lawson Zerby as Andrew. Now, all comfortable and tense? Good. Now, I want to warn you, if you feel a pair of thin, cold hands passing over your face, don't be frightened. The hands belong to a clock. A monster called Cleopatra's clock. It's a very unusual clock. For years, it's been giving people the works. The story is really the story of Sebastian Packer. Since this clock can only murder, since it can't talk, we let Sebastian speak for it. I'm a clockmaker. I carry on the profession my father taught me in London. I like clocks, all that is but one. For 30 years, I've looked for a certain clock and a certain man. The clock is known to collectors as Cleopatra's clock. The man... I swore to kill when, as a boy of 14, I closed my father's blazing eyes and wiped the froth of blood from his lips. Last night, I found Cleopatra's clock. Tonight, I may have found the man. I'm told you're an expert clock repairman, Mr... Uh, Packer, madam. Yes, I suppose I am. Well, I have a clock. Uh, rather, my husband has. Yes. And it hasn't run for years. Would you have a look at it? Well, can't you bring it in? Oh, heavens no. It weighs 500 pounds. One of those huge marble things. Italian Renaissance, I'd say. Marble? Italian? Uh, could you describe it further? Well, it's rather unusual. Black marble. Heavily carved with strange Egyptian characters. The ivory face has a beautifully etched scene on it, but it's a gruesome one. Gruesome? What kind of scene? It's a picture of a woman, a beautiful woman, and she's holding the limp form of a young man in her arms. Yes. It's ghastly. Cleopatra's clock. I knew without seeing it why the clock wouldn't run. It had been built in Italy for a prince of the House of Savoy in 1598. He conceived the clock when he discovered that his family treasures included 40 gold coins minted by Cleopatra and an Egyptian parchment. A parchment describing in horrible detail the death by poison of Cleopatra's young brother. The 40 gold coins were those Cleopatra had given a trusted servant to administer the poison to her brother. The writer of the parchment had slain the servant for his treachery and carried the coins with him to Rome. The Cleopatra clock was made to run only when the 40 gold coins were in place in the clock's hollow weights. Twenty in each weight. And the coins had been in my possession since the day of my father's death. Well, Mr. Packer, can you fix it? What? Huh? Oh, sorry. Daydreaming. Uh, yes, yes, of course. Uh, does Mr... Uh, Arnold. Does Mr. Arnold know that you're having the clock repaired? No. We've only been married a few weeks, and I'd, I'd like to have it working when he comes back to town tomorrow. Sort of a surprise. I see. I'll be there in half an hour, Mrs. Arnold. <laughs> Sir, 
So last night I went to the Arnold house. And I found Cleopatra's clock again. It's six feet of black marble glistening. It's pendulum motionless. It's hollow weights empty and waiting. I started to work. Fog horns from the East River sounded much as I remember they did in London. And suddenly I was back there on a fateful day about a fortnight after the clock had first been uncredited by my father. I was in the shop when the man from Scotland Yard stepped in. He walked straight to the clock and stared at it. Good afternoon, sir. Does the clock interest you? Very much. When did you acquire it? A cousin bought it at auction in Italy, and I'm displaying it for sale on consignment. My name's Pettibone, Scotland Yard. I've been looking for this clock for a month. It was stolen in Italy. Stolen? Yes, Mr. Packer, and worse, murder was done. You know, I'm afraid you've involved yourself in a bit of something here. But murder? I'm taking possession of the clock in the name of the Crown. I shall never forget the look of horror on the detective's face as he laid his hand on the clock's carved column. It froze there while his face drained to pasty white and his eyes bulged. He opened and closed his mouth soundlessly and crumpled to the floor, his hands to his throat. He was still and twisted and very dead. Mr. Pettibone had died of a heart attack the moment he took possession of the clock. My father wanted time to think, so I helped him drag Pettibone into the stockroom. I went to my quarters. I dozed fitfully to awake hours later at the sound of angry voices. Well, Cousin Andrew, you've done me a fine turn, haven't you? I've told you I didn't mean to kill the old girl. It was an accident. And don't talk so loud, the boy will hear us. You killed her as soon as you learned that she'd made out a will in your favor. And then when you thought it was safe, you sold all her furnishings and sent the clock to me to sell. All right, I did. And you're in it to the ears. I'll I'll go to the police. And how will you explain poor stiff Mr. Pettibone lying in your stockroom all this while? Well, I... Besides, there's nothing to fear. Now that uh, Pettibone is gone... He was the only one who suspected me. Now, you're the only one who knows. I'll crate this cursed black monster tomorrow and you leave with it. And will you also crate Mr. Pettibone? Oh. Oh, Look, I have a plan. Here, sit down in this chair right here. And I'll show you how we can solve the whole thing. My young heart beat with a wild dread as I listened. I could only see Cousin Andrew's back. But I could see Father, seated dejectedly in the chair near the black marble clock, his head in his hands. It was midnight. All the clocks in the shop began striking the hour. And louder than all the rest was the chime of the evil clock. If only then I had known, I might have done something. Eight. Nine. Ten, eleven, twelve. And before my horrified eyes, the heavy marble piece leaned slowly from the wall and crashed across my father's back. (laughs) Cousin Andrew stood facing my father as the clock pinned his frail form in the crushed chair. It choked him. He made little pitiful sounds, his eyes begging for life. But my cousin Andrew just stood his back to me and watched. Wondering sinners, you die hard. Then cousin Andrew ran from the shop, crying for help and claim an accident. I raced into the shop. My father was dead. I choked back my tears. I closed his poor staring eyes. Then, for some reason, I thought of the coins and the clock's weights. I took them and I ran from the shop the blood-stained gold pieces jangling merrily in my pocket. Armed with the notion that the coins were of value and the definite notion that I must eat, I approached one of the many dingy little curio shops in the Limehouse district. I stepped through the fog toward a shop where a dim light burned in the rear. Every inch of wall and ceiling was hung with curios, the old armor, swords, shields. I would have run out, 
But a wizened, apish man barked at me from the rear. Well, what do you want? I... I have something to sell. Uh, what have you got? I, I have 40 gold pieces, sir. Uh, they're, they're supposed to have been the coins Cleopatra paid a servant to poison her brother. I twist the scrawny neck off of you. You're pulling my leg, eh? Oh, no, sir. I'm not pulling your leg, sir. Here they are. Blimey. Gold, right enough. Uh, where did you cop them? I didn't steal them. They they belonged to my father. Oh, oh it's a likely tale. <laughs> Will you buy them, sir? Oh, ho, ho, ho. buy them, he says. Oh, ho, 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 ho. Buy them. Oh, ho, ho. Hey, you get out of here before I cause a bob of your scamp. Go on, I'll get out. Give me back my coin. Get out or I'll come about and fetch you a sound one. The ugly brute came toward me. He held my coins clutched in a tight, hairy fist. Before I could move, he'd struck me. Oh. The wall with a clatter. And then it, it happened. As I hit the wall, my eye caught a metallic gleam above me. I leaped back instinctively. As the hairy arm thrust at me again, a heavy metallic object dropped from the ceiling. It struck across the forearm of the clenched fist. I stared first at the man's gaping mouth, then at the great bleeding gash in the arm he clutched with his other hand, at the blood that dripped on the object that had struck him. It was an ancient headsman's axe. The gaping mouth opened and closed, making no sound. And then, with a moan of horror, the pawnbroker crumpled to the floor. I clamped my mouth upon a cry of panic. I stooped to gather all the coins that had fallen from the man's hand. Blood made them slippery. Dusting them into my pocket, I stumbled, whimpering in fright, through the shop and into the night. The fog of London never swallowed a more frightened and a more lonely boy. I hadn't touched those horrible coins since the day the storekeeper's wrist had been cut by the falling headsman's axe. By now, I half believed the legend that evil followed them. I began to feel that the only way I could escape their curse was to find the Cleopatra clock and put the coins back in the hollow weights where they belonged. One day, as I read the notices in the Times, my heart skipped a beat. Auction of clocks at Chopin Place Auction Rooms, Saturday at 7. Rare items, one of them. Fine Italian Renaissance piece of black marble. Rare treat for collectors. Come early. I went early. I was the auction room's first visitor. At the rear of the shop, a balding, dimly-eyed man looked up, appraised me as poor in prospect, and turned back to his paper. I felt the 40 gold coins in my pocket as I sauntered casually towards the black, gleaming clock. Other clocks about were ticking. Only the pendulum of the Egyptian clock remained motionless. As I cautiously opened the glass door of the clock to reach for the hollow weights, I seemed to hear my father's words again. It's an evil clock, son. Evil as Satan himself. I reached for one of the weights, my intention being to unscrew the cap of the weight quickly and to replace the coin. But I saw something I'd never noticed before. Directly beneath the right-hand weight was a small, round, flat bit of metal set into the floor of the pendulum box. It startled me. I looked over my shoulder towards the man in the rear. He was watching me. I had the unhooked weight in my hand within the clock. I'd have to work fast now to replace the coins. My fingers were sweaty with excitement. The weight slipped and fell directly on the metal piece beneath it. I say, what are you doing there? I paid no attention to the man now coming toward me because something was happening within the clock. A whirring sound. The sound of wheels turning, perhaps. And then in open-mouthed wonder, I watched the supporting panel in the front of the clock suddenly start to rise on hinges. The clock was off balance. The clock moved forward ponderously and I stood there transfixed in the path of a black marble monster. It's falling out, you idiot! I jumped to one side. Idiot! Wait for no more. I ran for the street. Help! The coins jangled merrily in my pocket as before. I was where I'd started, only as I ran, I knew. I knew. 
My father had been murdered, and I knew how, and I knew who had done it. I walked for miles, trying to pull myself together. I wandered aimlessly, or so I thought. But fate had traced my path before me, because I was startled to find myself staring into the shop window of a rare coin dealer named Megaroid. I walked into the shop. Mr. Megaroid seemed a nice little man. He smiled a bit quizzically at my firm belief that I possessed the betrayal coins of Cleopatra. I poured them on his counter. Oh, I say, you, you... You could be right, you know. These are the right era. Oh, I say, suppose they were... Let me put a glass to them. Uh, would they be worth a great deal, even if they weren't? Well, uh, let me see, let me see. Oh, yes, gracious, yes, they, they are nearly new. Fine condition, they should be worth a great deal as collector's items. Well, uh, Mr. McElroy, I, I, I feel there's something I ought to tell you about these pieces. Uh, yes? They... Oh... It's not important. Oh, well, uh, no, just a moment. I, I have a catalogue on this uh, Egyptian era in my show window. I, I'll fetch it to just a jiffy. The coins lay on the counter. I watched Mr. Megalroyd run down the aisle. As he approached the display window, his foot caught in an electric wire which lay across the floor. The lights went out and I saw him pitch forward. Mr. Megalroyd! The street light peered through the broken plate glass. It made across a grotesquely sprawled form in the shop window. I needed no more light than there was to see what had happened. The upper half of the heavy plate glass had broken and dropped flat against the solid lower half. Mr. Megaroid lay as the pawn shopkeeper had, holding with one hand the bleeding forearm he had pushed through his plate glass window as he tripped. The gold coins were on the floor, covered with blood once again. And tonight, I will find out if Mr. Arnold is Cousin Andrew. If he is, I shall feel no remorse in killing him. While working to repair the clock last night, I discovered that my father's accidental death had been a well-conceived, diabolical murder. If the right-hand weight was heavier than normal, thus reached the floor of the clock on the twelfth stroke of midnight, it tripped a trigger which collapsed the base of the clock and caused it to fall forward. My father had died on the twelfth stroke of midnight. Have you finished, Mr. Parker? Uh, no, Mrs. Arnold. Uh, I'll have to come back tomorrow night. What time do you expect Mr. Arnold tomorrow? Oh, well, about 11, I'd say. Will you be finished by then? Well, I... I think so. I'll have to take these weights to the shop with me, though. Something, uh, has to be added. I've put the coins in their place within the weights. Not 20 in each weight, but 20 in one and 10 in the other. The other 10 coins are in my pocket. In another pocket, I have a small 38, although I don't plan to use it. I have a 30-year-old date to keep. Uh, think you'll have it fixed in time to strike uh, midnight, uh... Oh, yes, Mr. Arnold. It will strike at midnight. There we are. Weights are in place now. And let's see, it's exactly five minutes before midnight. We set the hands and then just a little show on the pendulum. So, and Cleopatra's clock ticks again. Uh, it wakes from a 30-year sleep, eh? Uh, cousin Sebastian? Cousin? Well, that's what I wanted to tell you. My wife told me your father owned this clock in London. Oh, yes. Uh, then uh, I was your father's cousin. So uh, you are Sebastian Packer. 
the little boy who ran away uh, that night. And you were cousin Andrew. Yes, yes. Well, seriously, I, I don't know how much you know of that horrible night when your father was killed. I... I know the clock fell on father. I heard the sound from my room. I was frightened. I came down the stairs later... Time to see them carry father away. He's all covered up. Well, that was why I didn't find you in your room afterward. It happened so fast. Yes. We were sitting, talking. The clocks in the store were striking 12. Suddenly, the base of Cleopatra's clock seemed to cave in, and... I know. I, uh... I bought the clock at an auction a few years later. Sentimental, I guess. Yeah. Had it all fixed. It's good and solid now. I saw to that. <laughs> yes. Well, I... I think I'd better run along now, Cousin Andrew. Oh, nonsense, nonsense. Let's make up for lost time and get acquainted. Uh, well, come I... now, come now. I have some fine old port from England here. Sit down a while. No, no, not that chair. Hmm? This one's a lot more comfortable. Oh, very well. It's a funny thing. When you work with clocks as long as I have, you get to be quite philosophical about time. Oh, is that so? Mm. Oh, well, here I sit by the big clock, just as my father said 30 years ago. Do you know how many seconds ago that was, Cousin Andrew? No, do you? Well, there are 350,360,000 seconds in 10 years. That would be uh, 946,080,000 seconds in 30 years. You've got quite a mechanical mind, Sebastian. Uh, here, uh, try this port here. Okay. Here's the father. What's the matter, Cousin Andrew? Are you ill? No. Your face is drawn and grey. <laughs> well, Cousin Andrew, it's late. It's after midnight. Let her go. I say, you do look awfully ill. No, I don't care. I'm don't bring sinners. I... Where are you going? Don't go. I, I must go, Cousin Andrew. I told the patrolman near my shop that I would like him to meet me at 20 after midnight. The, the patrolman? Yes. But here, sit down and relax. Take my chair. It's more comfortable. Well, you're shaking like a leaf. And you just sit quietly. I'll see myself out. Thundering sinners. Good night, Cousin Andrew. Sebastian. Sebastian. Get it off. Get the clock off me. You die hard, too, don't you? It was just a matter of timing. I set the hand a minute fast, and the weight didn't touch your clever little spring device till just now, because it's lighter by ten pieces of blood-stained gold from the coffers of another murderer, Cleopatra. Oh. Rest easy, father. And a fine chime was had by all. Gonna leave you now, folks, with a timely moral. You can figure out how long you've lived, sure. That's your pastime. But figuring out how long you're going to live, that's just any old time. <laughs> oh, yes, by the way, this story should teach you another lesson. Never complain when you have to work late. Remember that overtime is certainly better than under time. <laughs>
Sanctum was heard in the United States over CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System, and has been rebroadcast for service men and women overseas. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education.